Welcome back to the Manga Bay Newscast. I am your host, Mike DiGirolamo, bringing you the news and inspiration from nature's front line, filling in for your regular host, Mike Gaurecki. This week on the newscast, I caught up with Leif Cox, founder of the International Elephant Project, the International Tiger Project, and the Orangutan Project. Leif previously spoke with me back in January of 2021 on the Sumatra season of Manga Bay Explorers, Episode 6, covering the Sumatran elephant. We get his thoughts on recent news concerning the species, specifically their shrinking habitat in North Acha due to palm oil and the villages that have banded together to reduce the incidence of human-elephant conflict in the region. We also get an update from Leaf from another story we covered on Manga Bay Explore Sumatra, the Batang Toru Dam, and the critically endangered Tapanuli orangutan, which was covered on episode 4 of that season. Links are provided in the show notes for both episodes. Leaf joins me from Perth, Australia. So, hi, Leaf. Welcome back to the podcast. It's uh, great to hear from you again. Oh, thank you. It's wonderful to be here, Mike. Thank you. So, where are you joining us from, and is there anything in particular you're working on that you want to share with us? At the moment, I'm in Perth, Western Australia, um, at our offices here. And, um, yeah, I'm working on, at the moment, regenerative agriculture for the indigenous communities of the Bukatikula ecosystem, trying to solve a particular problem of uh, um, providing food security and nutrition um, for the indigenous community when the vast majority of their ancestral lands are now been taken up by large multinationals. About a year and a half ago, you and I spoke about the Sumatran elephant, which uh, mm-hmm. some experts, including yourself, have said only have about 10 years left to be saved. How do their prospects look today? Look, it, it, it's like a lot of conservation and the planet is up in the air. And then we talk about, like, this is the most important decade in human history. And this is the most important decade f- for the survival of Sumatran elephant. And that's intrinsically linked. And there's feedback loops, which, which are important with saving our planet as a as an ecological entity that can support, you know, people and communities. And so this 10 years is, is extremely important because if we fail in this 10 years, we will see the Sumatran elephant eventually collapse to extinction. Um, but if we can do the important necessary work now, um, we won't have a sustainable population of elephants in 10 years. That ship has left the, you know, the, the station long ago. But we can have a recoverable population of Sumatran elephants that with management can one day again in a more enlightened time be reunited into one secure, viable population. So you previously mentioned that you're working on saving five to eight complete ecosystems and supporting elephant reintroduction in Laos. Can you give us an update on either of those? Well, certainly the the work we're supporting with elephant reintroduction in Laos is going fantastic. And so what what, what that project is showing, that elephant reintroduction is possible. And, you know, in fact, if compared to, let's say, orangutan reintroduction, it's relatively easy. So that's wonderful news. And so if we can save these wild ecosystems in time, there there really then is no need for elephants to um, be in captivity. And and certainly we know they don't do well there psychologically, nor is it in captivity you can actually save a species through captive breeding. That's that's something that's really not possible. And and so it's certainly a, a great learning that we've discovered now and of course yeah we're still working um to save the ecosystems for the sumatran elephant and when we're talking about that we're not talking about saving a a ecosystem where a viable population can survive as i said that train has left the station long ago it's about saving enough ecosystems where herds of 120 150 elephants can survive yeah, and but then those herds need to be managed by connecting the bulls when they leave the herd and then move into human dominated landscapes and often at this stage getting killed, moving them to the next ecosystem where they can breed and, and connect with a new herd of females. A conservationist in the story that Mongabe recently wrote, Chased from Every Side, about their dwindling habitat due to palm oil, described Acha as their best hope for survival. What makes the province of Acha stand out in this? No, the best hope for survival is not just Acha because 
you know, if you just say Actia alone, the, the, there's not enough elephants left for the population to survive. It's certainly Actia is, is one of the key areas that contain ecosystems where elephant herds can survive if we save the ecosystem in, in time. And it's only because Actia has been, um, in a sense, sheltered due to the independence movement and the troubles up there and the rate of destruction of the rainforest was at least minimised until recently. So they're, they're a little bit further um, behind on the destructive practices which have led to the localised extinction of elephants in many other areas of Sumatra. So you and I spoke about human-elephant conflict previously and about how this further exacerbates the survival of elephants. And Mongbe recently wrote about the Indonesians on the front lines of human-elephant conflict in Sumatra. What can you tell us about the farmers that are volunteering in patrols to reduce HEC in North Sumatra? How much do conservation response units like this improve their survival odds? Look, greatly, because, um, you know, the, the big multinationals have taken pretty much the, the lion's share of land and opportunity. And so I characterise it as the, the poor and indigenous communities and the wildlife, such as elephants, are stuck <laughs> in the last remaining area trying to eke out a, a living. And, um, and, of course, without support, there's the natural conflict. Elephants want their land and, and their food to survive as self-aware persons trying to make a living. And, and, and the human population is trying to do the same thing. Um, and so it's very important that we, uh, we work together with both elephants and people to solve the human-elephant conflict. We can at least have these herds survive in the last remaining ecosystem and, and take the Sumatran elephant species um, of subspecies through this extinction crisis. You previously mentioned that in order to truly save these elephants, that it's going to take rehabilitating lowland and riverine forests. And has any progress been made on this since you and I last spoke? Yeah, well, that's extremely important because um, normally within conservation, um, you know, and Sumatra is a classic example, what is conserved is the highlands and hills because this is not really suitable for conversion to unsustainable monoculture such as palm oil or and it's also very good for um, supporting water catchment unfortunately tigers orangutans and far more so with the elephants they can't utilize the the highlands and hilly areas and so you can we can save all the rainforest that we like and national parks that we like but elephants will still be slowly driven to extinction so our opportunity is um is to gain the lowland areas which have all previously been logged and um, restore them and at the moment we're working um for example we have a um joint company with wwf and fzs um in book tigapulu in sumatra which is um leasing the critical lowlands for a herd of 150 elephants there and we're supporting the acquisition of several other concessions in the northeast um, of the looser ecosystem to, to save the last viable herds in, in the looser ecosystem up there. So something one of the farmers mentioned in one of our stories is that these elephants are human in that they have feelings. And like you previously said, they are self-aware persons. Do you think that there's mm -hmm. growing recognition of the personhood of non-human animals such as the Sumatran elephant? And do you think this will make a difference in their survival or their conservation prospects? Look, I, I think so in, in the long term. The, the, um, the recognition of personhood in, in sentient um, persons such as elephants is, is, is one of the critical points. Um, but when we're living in a world where the rights of, of um, human persons aren't, aren't often recognised or, or, or at least adh adhered to, we're certainly a long way from that becoming a significant factor. So it's all part of that slow process of, you know, um, building a more ethical, moral world where the, the rights of all beings are, are, are recognised for the benefit of all because we're what we're discovering with climate change and um as, a, as an example, is that we're all interconnected. You know, we, 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 we no longer have the luxury of, of psychologically excluding other nations, people, races and, and animals and not 
see a feedback loop which is going to cause the destruction of the persons that we care about in in our small communities but in the meantime it yeah that's a long-term strategy i believe um, that's needed to start now and move forward in the meantime i believe it's all about very direct meaningful actions on the ground to um, take these populations through this critical 10 years the Batang Toru Hydro Dam project in North Sumatra, which is currently ongoing, threatens the only known habitat of the recently described Tapanuli orangutan, but the project has killed 16 people in less than two years. What is your take on the status of this project, which some have called cursed? Well, look, I, I can't, I can't, the only thing I can say, look, 16 people dying is, is a tragedy. One person dying is is a tragedy and um the efficacy of the the safety issues and the um, engineering i can't comment on i'm not a engineer or, or or geologist i can only comment in the broader aspect of the tapanuli orangutan which is you know which in, in essence is the microcosm of um an example of what we're experiencing with all these critically endangered um megafauna and so the population of Tapanuli orangutan is below sustainable levels already. It's already fragmented into these three subpopulations. And so the, the fundamental strategy we need is, number one, is to stop the poaching because this is kind of where Tapanuli got to in the first place because unlike the, the Sumatran orangutans north of Lake Toba, the Tapanuli orangutan, which likely existed across the whole of southern Sumatra, was basically reduced to this remnant population, not by the logging or the um, conversion to unstable monocultures that we've seen over the last 20, 30 years that are now affecting the Sumatran orangutan, but by hunting, you know, low levels of hunting um, greatly affecting and, and slowly wiping out the Tapanuli until there is last remnant population is extremely hill, extremely hard to get to areas of the Batantora ecosystem. And so what we have to do is, first of all, is stop the, one of the major drivers of hunting, and that's what we're doing. We're supporting two ranger units and community work to stop the hunting, which is the reason that they, they got there. The, the second is to try to connect the, the, the populations as much as possible. And the third is to realise, even if we do that, there's not enough Tapanuli orangutan to have a genetically viable population which won't eventually collapse. And so we certainly have to plan ahead into more enlightened times where we can expand the ecosystem um, into the crit critical lowland riverine areas. And this is probably more likely to be part of of what's necessary to retain the agricultural and economic sustainability of the area as well. But the good news is orangutans, as the slowest reproducing species in the world, lose genetic diversity very slowly because genetic diversity is lost every breeding generation. So we do have some time up our sleeves, but we don't have an immediate solution for them now. But certainly we believe, first of all, it's um, stop the poaching, connect the existing populations and start a strategic plan to expand habitat when the opportunity arises. But that's going to be um, at least several years, if not a decade away. Something else you and I talked about last time we spoke is that while we should all want to have systemic government reform to tackle these large issues, there just simply isn't enough time to do it. And that supporting organizations that are working on the ground was a more realistic approach. Has anything changed since then, either for the better or worse? N nothing has changed, although the signs have changed, as we're saying. We've see, certainly seen the signs we talked about, the, the moral inclusion of ele elephants a person. And although the court case failed in the US, there were certainly some very strong dissenting views from judges about the the, in a sense, the personal rights of elephants. So, and, and certainly I've been involved in the case of giving personal rights to um, orangutans in South America. So there is, you can see this change and we can see maybe a growing realisation. We see increasing natural disasters that we have to uh, move on. But, you know, all governments around the world uh, seem particularly still very much captive by large business interests and, and not reflecting the needs of the people which they purport to represent, you know. And so that's going to take systemic change, 
you know, over over many years. And so, yeah, unfortunately, as, as I said, yeah, elephants and tigers and, and orangutans don't have time for that. Although that's important work that has to start now and continue. It's not negating that work, if that makes sense. It's not absolutely necessary to get to the end point. But in the meantime, we have to do these very immediate and um, strategic on the ground projects to say complete functioning ecosystems and viable populations or subpopulations. Otherwise, we may, we may um, get a better world, but we're not going to have the genetic resources, biodiversity and recoverable ecosystems which future gen- more enlightened generations in the future can use to heal and recover this planet. Something else you mentioned the last time we spoke is that you acknowledge that while extractives such as palm oil are driving these elephants to extinction, you said that even if we were to ban all palm oil tomorrow, that's not enough to solve the situation. Can you explain again why this is? Well, because it's not really addressing the actual driver. Um, you know, so I can understand from the outside, you see there's rainforest, and next time you see there's a palm oil plantation. So palm oil is replacing rainforest, you know, and therefore if I stop palm oil, I'm going to save the rainforest. But that's not really what is happening. The, the forest will be destroyed for the value of its trees. It's worth millions and billions of dollars. And so, and so there's an economic drive that just to simply destroy the trees. And once those trees are destroyed, there's an economic driver um, beyond palm oil to plant unsustainable monocultures to get maximum profit in a short period of time. And so addressing just one single commodity doesn't really affect the business case and the actual drivers, which is destroying the forest. So that's why I say, in a sense, um, addressing a palm oil or a single issue is, is, is never going to achieve the outcome. What we need is two things, is, is change in land use status, um, and that's obviously advising government policy of what's needed for a sustainable economy and sustainable environment that's going to support the Indonesian people. So that knowledge and understanding. And in, in, in a direct way, supporting the companies which are going to uh, are applying and leasing that land and then restoring it as a practical on the thing. Um, that's that's going to be um, far more effective in addressing um, single commodities or even single companies. Other than the stories that we've mentioned and the issues that we've talked about, does anything else about Sumatran elephants or Tapanuli orangutans for that matter stand out to you that you think is worth mentioning? The main thing is, of course, with, with you know, with all these is, is megafauna is, um, you know, that they are, in a sense, the canary in the coal mine, if that makes sense, so, you know, of, of the whole situation we're, we're experiencing on the planet and that have intrinsic rights um, to survive as individuals in the species, just as we do. And so without um, the necessarily expansion of, of the moral imperative to protect other persons, even non-human persons, we were not going to be able to su- survive as a species on, on this planet. I, I guess in the article you shared, I, I guess maybe your reflection when we're discussing, there's nothing new in that. <laughs> it's, it's again, it, it's, it, it continues that the, the important highlighting of um, what's happening. But one of the interesting things maybe that wasn't mentioned is what we're doing is in a couple of ecosystems we started to support the protection of the herds. Um, there's no bulls left. There's only one tussless bull left in the Way Canvas National Park because all the other bulls have been poached and he's related to the other females. So now we're fundraising and we're transferring two bulls from the Booker Tigapul ecosystem that will just naturally disperse and get killed in the human dominant landscape to there to save the herd. We've already transferred a, a bull into the Harapan forest where there's only female elephants left. And so one of the important things we, we, we're doing is um, we're already starting to manage the elephant population, the make population. Once we can start protecting the herds and particularly the bulls, which, which are disappearing first because of the value of the, the ivory. So that's, that's probably um, as well as the supporting the first testing of elephant reduction is a very important part of proof of concept and, and our ability 
to manage these herds as, as a mega population by the transfer of bulls at the natural energy dispersion. So that's an interesting um, development in smart tuned elephants. And is there anything else that you're working on right now that you would like to share with us? Are you aware of the, the book that we publish, Island Elephants? I'm not, no. It's a fantastic book by our um, elephant f- um, project film manager, Alex Mokenbecker. It's, all, it's available free in Bahasa, um, but we also have an English version. And it's basically the, the definitive book on um smart to elephants and basically outlines our whole conservation plan of how we're going to save these herds and, and manage them as a mega population. And the, the other thing I, I didn't mention was um, we're now working with a consortium of people, leading a consortium of people to monitor elephants through recording their subsonic communications. And so you can identify the individuals and locations through, through monitoring the subsonic communication that elephants do be, between themselves, between herds and within herds. And this should then um, make it much easier and eliminate the need to radio collar elephants in order to protect and monitor the herds. So there's some great science that's been de- developed there to better help us secure and manage the herds. I mean, there's, there's, there's so, so many things. And so, um, of course, one of the most wonderful things I do experience is when, you know, I, I go to Indonesia and I've just returned from there is, is the, the wonderful young Indonesians who, you know, that the new generation of Indonesians who are um, committed and have self-sacrifice for the, for the good of orangutans, the environment and, and the future of the country. One of the things that, you know, we, we're all supporting is those young Indonesian conservationists who are coming up and, and by God, there's some wonderful young Indonesians there, which gives us a great hope if we can save enough habitat environment that I believe in the future, the environment of Indonesia will be in good hands. Leif, thanks so much for joining us again. You're most welcome. Thanks, Mike. To hear more on Sumatran elephants in the Tapanuli orangutan, please do check out Mongabay's sister podcast series, Mongabay Explorers, where you'll find season after season exploring a unique place or species. Season 2 on Sumatra features context for the conversation you just listened to on episodes 6 and 4, respectively. Links are provided in the show notes. Please subscribe and tell your friends. But if you enjoyed this podcast, the Manga Bay Newscast, we also ask that you help please spread the word by telling a friend. It is the best way to help expand our reach and keep growing. You can also support us by becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Manga Bay. We are a non-profit news outlet, so even just a dollar per month will really help us offset the production costs and hosting fees. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, head to patreon.com forward slash mongabay to learn more and support the Mongabay newscast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash mongabay. You and your friends can join the listeners who have downloaded the Mongabay newscast nearly half a million times by subscribing to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. Or you can download our app for Apple or Android devices. Just search either app store for the Mongabay newscast app to gain fingertip access to our new shows and all of our previous episodes. And yes, you can always read our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mongabay.com. Or if you prefer to keep up with us on social media, give us a follow at facebook.com forward slash mongabay or on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, where our handle is at mongabay on all platforms. Thanks, as always, for listening to the Mongabay Newscast. I am your interim host, Mike DiGirolamo, filling in for Mike Gaurecki. I'll see you next time. <laughs>